This Voice of San Diego podcast is brought to you by Manilatis Nelson Murphy, Advertising and Public Relations. As a nonprofit news organization, we depend on our members, foundations, and sponsors like M&M to provide funding to support the investigative journalism you expect from Voice of San Diego. We are very grateful for all of our supporters, and we will recognize them during the show. M&M is run by Tony Manilatis, Bob Nelson, and Kelly Murphy Lamkin, who bring a vast network and decades of experience to developers, public agencies, campaigns, and others. M&M bridges the gap between clients and the people whose influence matters most. M&M develops successful strategies and implements cost-effective tactics to help clients achieve their goals. The firm specializes in public affairs PR and advertising with an emphasis on media relations, crisis communications, community engagement, and cross-platform marketing. Our reporters at Voice of San Diego have heard from Tony and Bob a lot over the years. Tony, Bob, and Kelly are supporters of Voice of San Diego. Learn more about their firm at mnmadpr.com. And if you like Voice of San Diego's work and want to become a sponsor too, contact us at development at voiceofsandiego.org. Welcome to those of you listening on News Radio 600 Kogo. It's the Voice of San Diego on pa- podcast, a special edition. I have gotten rid of Sarah Libby and Andrew Keats and replaced them with Jesse Marks. Jesse, hello. Hey, Scott. And we have a special guest in studio. He's visiting with us for a couple of weeks. Sergey. Hi for everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sergey, uh, say your last name. Uh, Kai Germazov. Kai Germazov. Yeah. He visits, visits us from St. Petersburg, Russia. He has, of course, it's a, quite the timing. The World Cup is happening in Russia, so he came here. But uh, for those of you who've listened for a long time, he has a topic of interest that he has investigated as a journalist in St. Petersburg um, about stadiums, which is something we've investigated here. He did an investigation about the construction of the stadium in St. Petersburg and the treatment of the workers there. Give us a, a quick summary. Uh, so I did a story about the uh, conditions of the construction of this uh, stadium in St. P, uh, because it's a symbol of corruption uh, now in St. Petersburg, uh, if we are talking about the stadium. And I uh, shown to my audience uh, about how uh, terrible the conditions were in uh, this uh, construction. You actually went to work there, right? You yeah, you as, as a previous worker, uh, one for one day, uh, I tried to do my best to construct this uh, building. Sergey was describing how the original budget of the building was what, what like five billion rubles? Ruben? So the price uh, was uh, rise uh, uh, from uh, 6 b- billion rubles to 50. So the mm, the last price, it's about uh, $1 billion now. Wow, oh. wow. So uh, Sergey has been doing some uh, errands and such for us. He's going to get his own little uh, reporter contribution line on the story we've got coming on Monday. You went to the assessor's office, just waltzed in there and asked for some property records, right? Yeah, yeah, it was very pretty easy because uh, in Russia you can nothing uh, do with uh, uh, such kind of documents. So you, you need ID, you need a confirmation, you need accreditation to see the archive. Wow. And then uh, we also sent you to the Port Commission. And you, yeah. were, telling, you were telling me how uh, in Russia an, an event like that would... Uh, would have a lot of bodyguards with visible firearms and such. Absolutely, because uh, mayor was on this uh, commission. If our mayor uh, just appears somewhere, uh, you can uh, uh, go to him uh, very easy. No, and our mayor he doesn't like journalists at all. Maybe <laughs> only state-owned media. All right. Well, Sergey, uh, it's been wonderful having you, and uh, and let's see if we can. Uh, break some news together. He's particularly interested in California's experience with legalizing cannabis. We have some discussion about that coming up later in the podcast. Jesse's going to talk to Dr. Thomas Mark 
Cott. He's uh, with the UC San Diego Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. It's performing a, a very important experiment. It's a necessary public service, really, for the, for the world, that Tom and other researchers are paying people to get high and <laughs> testing their responses in simulated driving environments. So what, what made you interested in that? Um, well, I think that it's happening in our own backyard is pretty significant. And the fact that it could have very broad uh, reach at the end of all this, because they're essentially trying to figure out how it is that people react when they're under the influence of, of marijuana and they drive. So there could be public policy implications to this. And Tom gave us a sense of what they're doing exactly. Uh, and in addition to that study, they also are looking at, um, they have another grant to, to look at the possible links between CBD, which is a non-psychoactive component in marijuana, and autism. So Okay, interesting. So yeah, they're trying to basically handle that big problem. Like, how do you tell if somebody's high in a, in a situation where they shouldn't be? Exactly. And and the other question that has come up too is, is how do you, if somebody consumes marijuana one day and then two or three days later gets in a traffic accident, do you blame the marijuana for it? And frankly, in Colorado, certain law enforcement groups have been doing that. And Jeff Sessions has actually picked up on some of that data. So uh, hopefully the research that's, ha- that's happening in our own backyard will kind of help um, steady the conversation. Right, big news this Thursday, there was a event, press event at uh, City Hall where the mayor got up and had an announcement. And this is the fair plan that our neighborhoods deserve. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with my uh, colleagues on the city council uh, as we move this forward to get this done and across the finish line. We'll be working together. There will be give and take, uh, and that's part of the process. Uh, the council is set to vote on July uh, 16. And as I said, I'm looking forward to not only their input, but the, the input of many others. What he's talking about, of course, is the proposal he's put out on the list of regulations he has for vacation rentals in San Diego. We've obviously followed this debacle for some time. Uh, Jesse, you come from the, the desert. Was this an issue out there? Oh, it was a huge issue out there, actually, and they just went to the uh, ballot box to go legislate it. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, it, it was just a topic of conversation everywhere for right. the last year and a half, two years. So the mayor's proposal has a bunch of parts. One of them is you can rent out your primary residence up to six months a year, and a second home you can rent out year-round. You can allow home sharing where somebody stays in your house. That's just straight up. There's a minimum three-night stay, though, for downtown and coastal zones. And this was the one that was most interesting to me. It bars granny flat owners, these accompanying units on a lot, from uh, renting those units out to short-term vacation folks uh, for less than 30 days. So you can only rent those for a longer term. Yeah, and it's my understanding that a lot of people have bought those just for the purpose of renting them out, that's going to be a problem, right? Yeah, that'll be interesting. That'll probably be one of the flashpoints. It also mandates that those renting out their entire homes get an annual $949 license to host the guests for less than 30 days. So basically, if I think if I read this right, if if you leave for a summer and you want to rent out your home for the summer to, to vacationers, they'll have to, you'll have to get a license for uh, almost $1,000 to do that. And then you have to pay hotel taxes, of course, but also a nightly $2.76 affordable housing impact fee. Um, And then one last point, only homeowners with more than five bedrooms would need a permit to operate. So basically you don't have to get one of those conditional use permits, which could be laborious if you have five bedrooms. So I bet you there's some walls getting knocked down (laughs) in some parts to say that that that's just one bedroom. Faulkner, uh, the mayor proposes hiring 16 city staffers to um, enforce all these rules. And so it's my understanding that the proposals he he put forth is similar to the one that came up in December as well. Uh, and it looks like it's actually going to have a carve out for Mission Beach, really? which is probably going to be a bit controversial. We had an op-ed just a few weeks ago from the Mission Beach town council president who uh, argued that there are enough vacation rentals there already and cited statistics um, uh, suggesting that as much as 40% of the homes in Mission Beach are already used in some capacity as a short-term vacation rental. And uh, his argument that they're being left out of these regulations is just going to make things worse and more difficult for them. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see where they go. I know that the town council uh, passed a resolution yesterday opposing these rules and asking to be part of the conversation. Yeah, we'll see. So that as the mayor said, the uh, hearing date is July 17th, 
and uh, they'll go through that. Uh, or did they say 18 months? <laughs> right there. <laughs> and then um, one of the interesting parts is this part, though. Allow homeowners to rent out their primary residence for up to six months and then a second home year round. There's going to be a lot of people who start transferring title of their homes or their extra properties to other people, it seems like. I don't know how to police some of the trusts and stuff, so that might be one of the issues. There was a discussion at that uh, last year's hearing about some of the you know, potential restrictions. They basically are trying to keep corporations from buying large you know, um, bundles of homes and then uh, renting them all out as short-term vacation rentals. And this is, is meant to thwart that, but again, uh, policing that might be kind of hard. But they got all these 16 city staffers. I'm sure they'll be working their tails off. Policing's always been the problem. Like in, in, I was referring to Palm Springs a few yeah. minutes ago when we talked about the desert. It was the same thing. They had thousands of complaints. But a lot of them were just for pretty trivial things, that didn't problems that actually didn't even exist. So uh, I, I don't know how, how much time these staffers are going to tie up with, with meaningless Well, things. so what's interesting is before they would just say like, well, you can call the police if it's too noisy or whatever, mm-hmm. if there's an actual nuisance. But otherwise, you know, they're not really like breaking any laws. You know, people can go in and out of private properties as much as they want. And so with this, I guess what they would police is these things like the primary residence, the minimum stays, the whether they have the licenses, all those kinds of things. So that'll be fascinating to watch. I'm not going to get too crazy here because they'll probably punt it yet again. <laughs> but they do say they have the votes. So or they imply they feel like they have the votes on the city council. So San Diego will do a San Diegan again. It seems like it's a possibility, <laughs> but the mayor is uh, fired up these days trying to get stuff done. All right. Uh, another story on the site. Uh, whew, this is another in this long series of, of uh, revelations that Ashley McGlone has had in her quest to uncover and review the documents related to investigations of sexual misconduct in schools, uh, often by educators uh, with their students, and um, you know the the fight that we've had across the region to to unlock some of these records. So last year, three students we found came forward about a Chula Vista high school teacher who they said groped and sexually harassed them. A Sweetwater district official investigated and found his conduct to be severe and pervasive. Uh, officials didn't fire him though; they gave him one hundred thousand dollars to quit and agreed not to tell future employers about what they found. He then began teaching in Lakeside. Um, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't necessarily that they chose not to fire. It's so hard to fire uh, permanent teachers that, uh, that this is kind of the case we're seeing in some of these uh, situations where it's easier to, if it costs three or $400,000 to fire somebody or go through that whole process, maybe you can just offer them $100,000 to just walk away. But then it comes with some deal like, uh, like you don't tell future employers about it. So that whole... Uh, series and and especially this piece this might have been the most jarring one of the series so far so this is terrible uh but it is also reminiscent of what we saw like a decade ago two decades ago from the catholic church Mm -hmm. and i hate to say that but uh in this case somebody was uh, essentially punted to actually two schools right there's also a christian school which he had been working Uh, for a private christian youth youth theater um they let us know that he's no longer uh you know, teaching or advising there. And uh, it, so, yeah, there were, without, you know, this coming to light, it's it's pretty clear he could have kept going in different spots. Um, but it's just a, uh, uh, there were a lot of people, there's a lot of reaction um, to this story. Uh, after we do these stories, we just get inundated with um, other feedback and other information. And it's really jarring to read some of these things. But yeah, uh, it, you're right, like, it's it's hard to, to fire them, and so these kinds of situations move on where they get moved to other schools, and this is the second or third time we've seen these uh, shifts. And in, in bo- both of the schools did were, were unaware of his, his past as well, which is problematic. Um, and I guess we should also point out that, that he denied the allegations and said the school district had, or the school had a, a slanted report and also actually attempted to discredit the girls. Too. Yeah, I said that they were troubled girls that just made this up. So we got the documents though. You can read them for yourself at voicesandiego.org. Ashley has done an amazing job. This is some tough stuff for her to, um, you know, she's reviewing 10,000 pages of documents that have come and we haven't even got some of the bigger school districts in the region um, and their and their responses to this uh, this investigation we've been doing. So uh, it's uh, been arduous, but uh, very interesting stuff. 
All right, as well in the um, school news, I put on my education reporter hat this week. We're a little short-staffed, and uh, we are, by the way, in the process of recruiting a new education investigative reporter. But one of the most prestigious high schools in San Diego is the charter school, Preuss. It's always on the like U.S. News, like number six or five, uh, top in California or in San Diego. It serves only students from families with low incomes who would be the first to go to college. It's a charter school. And uh, it's all its seniors got into four-year colleges. It always touts like all these stats about how much, uh, how well its students do. But this year it had a new test. This was the first year, full year, almost done, where its teachers had a union. So um, I found out that a third of charter schools across the state have unionized teachers. And Preuss has been around almost 20 years. And this was uh, the, the teachers had been upset that salaries had been frozen for several years after uh, UC San Diego cut funding to the school. So it's part of UC San Diego, but it cut its million dollars sort of subsidy of the school. And uh, and then the teachers were frustrated by the fr- salary c- freeze. Not only did they pick to unionize with some better job protections, but they also chose the step and column, this uh, sort of infamous way that teachers get compensated where they get uh, steps for for more um, accreditation on their resume and then they get uh, these column achievements for just how um, how long they work so I, I was wondering why this wasn't a bigger deal because this happened last August correct but then I read in your story that about a third of charter schools are actually unionized is that correct yeah so I don't think it was I think it would have been a bigger deal but nobody just <laughs> reported on it I think it's the yeah. state of <laughs> of k-12 education reporting right now we do our our best I think but there's just uh, there's not enough reporters going on. When I heard about it, I'm like, why did nobody report on this? So I'm like, yeah. I should report on it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's it seems like a huge deal. Uh, the whole tension between charter schools and advocates for them and unions has been such in the news that a unionized charter school, especially one of the top ones like that, would be seem like a bigger deal. As as Rye said in the morning report, if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. So. Um, the uh, the one thing that was really interesting to me about this is right now uh, teachers at traditional schools uh traditional um public schools have a two year sort of probationary period where they can be pretty easily dismissed compared to after those two years when they become permanent teachers where it, that's where it gets to the point where it's like you know it takes several years several hundred thousand dollars to dismiss them unless they agree because they 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 want out too and so uh the the charter union contract at Preuss is really interesting. So it says five years, they're on a one-year contract. So if they don't renew their contract, they're out. After that five years, then they're on rolling two-year contracts. So you, if you are dis, you know, if they're disappointed with a teacher's performance, then they can let them know they won't be getting another contract, and they have another year to sort of get, you know, get it back on track or whatever. And then they're out. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, basically a year notice. And what's interesting about the the state law that requires for the for traditional ter- teachers, that's not, it says two years, but it's actually less than that because they have to let them know by March uh, whether they're going to let them go. And so that's not quite two full years, about a year and change to before they have to make a decision about whether to let a, a new teacher go. And that's just not enough time, really. I think a lot of people have said, uh, t- to make that decision. So we'll see. Uh, that's just one uh, example of, of how things might be different. All right, our hero of the week. Whew, I don't know if I can do this. This is tough. Hero this week is Mayor Kevin Faulkner. What? Yeah. Wow. Well, you knew that. <laughs> uh, so look, um, Andy Keats had an amazing story, I thought, a really interesting story about the San Diego Association of Government. So the mayor um, hadn't been going to the San Diego Association of Government. This is like the UN. You, each city has a representative on the board. He didn't usually attend because he kind of recognized that that it, you know there was a lot of unanimity, right? They just kind of did what they did. And he... Um, uh, I think he could have had a bigger role there, and I, I've actually criticized him for not going there. But uh, now he's going. Boy, <laughs> he's going. <laughs> so Andy Keats did a story about a closed session hearing where uh, the San Diego Association of Governments Board of Directors was informed that their top choice for executive director of the agency 
just withdrew his op- application. He's from the um, Puget Sound area in, in Washington. He's like, no, nah, I don't want to work there. And so they're like, well, let's give the job to the number two, Kim Kawada, the chief uh, deputy executive director. And uh, the thing with her is she was, we pulled a clip from her last year, you might remember. Uh, she was deeply involved in the response to the uh, scandal about their revenue projections that we uncovered. And uh, they voted to make her the executive director. And then the mayor, Kevin Faulkner, raised his hand and said, no, I call for a weighted vote. Um, And in the weighted vote, they rejected that. Andy found out about all this, did a story. And the reaction was (laughs) really interesting. The whole board was like, we are going to go and find these leakers. <laughs> we are going to crush them. And and the best part of it is that in the process, they may have leaked more information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sam Abed, this was great. Sam Abed was talking and he's like, yeah, one of them, uh, a labor group even contacted one of the applicants for this job. Yeah. And, he's, and we're like, oh, really? Where did you find that out? <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, rather than uh, find the leakers and do your big uh, witch hunt, maybe just try to focus on getting somebody with some new perspective and leadership skills for this job. It's a good idea. But uh, Faulkner's been doing this. He's, uh, he's uh, you know, we've criticized him a lot for not having a, a clear direction or priorities and, and fighting for them. That is not the way he's been lately. So, um, And he stepped up on the vacation rentals, as we just talked about as laid, well. Finally yeah. laid out his vision for that, and uh, he's been pushing really hard for this homeless and convention center tax increase. Now, say what you will about that. He's certainly putting all his cards on the table. Our goat of the week. You lose. Good day, sir. So the goat of uh, the week this week goes to the DCCC for uh, hitting Assemblyman Rocky Chavez and uh, discouraging bipartisanship up in Sacramento. Uh, so they would argue um, that the the TV ad that they put out during the uh, before the primary election in California's 49th congressional district uh, was necessary to knock Chavez out of the race, and it was ultimately effective. Right, he finished uh, sixth place, I want to say somewhere somewhere down the list. And essentially, what the DCCC had criticized him for these are the National Democrats, uh, National Democratic operatives in DC. What they criticized Chavez for was working with Democrats in Sacramento. Yeah, broken promises. He was too cooperative with their party, with uh, crucial votes too. Yeah, it was on cap and trade, mm-hmm. uh, which was which is a key piece of California's climate change legislation. It was the renewal of these permits for polluters, and Chavez took a lot of flack for crossing the aisle and doing what he felt was the right thing. And then to have the Democratic Party then you know throw dirt in his eye was was probably pretty insulting to him. But uh, immediately after it happened, I was hearing from GOP um, consultants basically saying, "Hey, look, if I have." If I had any clients up in Sacramento, I would be telling them, I would be showing them this advertisement right now and telling them, don't cross party lines. Right, right. So that kind of short term nihilism might be good for, you know, these short term political goals, but it's exactly why the whole governance structure in this country is so poisoned right now. Uh, Everybody focusing on just their short term power arguments. So, all right, we have uh, more again on this whole uh, academic research on marijuana and cannabis. And uh, for those of you listening on News Radio 600 Kogo, you can find us on podcast. And this has been our partnership with them uh, for our Voice of San Diego podcast. One of my favorite things to do in San Diego is uh, what's called the Pier Jump in support of uh, what's called now the Prevent Drowning Foundation of San Diego. You know, look, Voice of San Diego is sponsored by thousands of uh, donors and corporate sponsors and uh, some of our partners like the Prevent Drowning Foundation. We value all the people who support Voice San Diego and sometimes uh, invite them on to tell their stories. So this is a sponsored interview that I did quickly with uh, my friends at the Prevent Drowning Foundation and Buck Buchanan, the president there. Uh, I, again, am very passionate about this program. People need to know how to swim and we need to have uh, equi- equitable opportunities for everybody to get into the water and learn that. It's something I'm very passionate about. And the Pier Jump, April, August 13th, is always uh, one of my favorite experiences of the year. So listen to this and uh, maybe join me August 13th this year. Okay, we're joined in here by Buck Buchanan. He's the president and founder of the Prevent Drowning Foundation of San Diego. He's also a longtime lifeguard and uh, friend. Welcome, Buck. Hey, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we were going to talk in here today about one of my favorite events in 
San Diego. It is the annual peer jump at OB. OB, uh, it's a very special event for me. I've always enjoyed doing it. But first of all, when did this start and what's it all about? Okay, so when I, w- when I did work for the city, actually the Junior Lifeguard Program has jumped off the pier forever, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and so what we did is we struck uh, basically an understanding and a whole MOU with the city of San Diego so that the Prevent Drowning Foundation of San Diego teams with the Junior Guard Program, and we get a chance to invite family and friends to join their kids jumping off the pier. Right. So it's a heck of a celebration, and it's, it's high energy, as you know. So for the rest of my sponsored interview with Buck Buchanan and this whole experience, uh, tune in after the podcast. We are back. Hello, Jesse. Hey, Scott. So it was an interesting week uh, for the marijuana industry in San Diego County. Uh, Up in Oceanside, there is an introduction of a new ballot measure. So the city council up there had approved an ordinance a couple of weeks ago, actually back in April, which didn't actually include the sale of marijuana. It was purely cultivation, distribution, testing, uh, manufacturing. That's and so funny. Why would they want everything but the availability? Because you you get potentially the tax revenue without having a public facing store. Oh, so front. like if you if you sell. A- uh, the wholesale or something, you have to pay a tax still on that. Uh, I would assume so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and there was a lot of fear from the from city hall, certain officials at city hall, and from the law enforcement, basically saying this is going to increase crime. So you you if you get rid of the storefront, you get rid of some of those problems. Right. Um, so there's a new ballot measure in the works which would um, make up for that lack of retail storefront. And then also down in Imperial Beach last week, the there had been an ordinance in the work for more than a year, but it's um, it's in limbo right now because a group of anti-marijuana activists showed up, quite frankly, got in the heads of a couple of different council members. As far as we can tell, people who had been supporting it are now on the fence. So we don't really know what's going to happen to that. They pushed it back a couple of weeks. Everybody thought this was a done deal. Uh, now, not so much. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. IB has... Some people who like marijuana, <laughs> quite a, quite a few. So the the estimate I've the analysis I've seen suggests that about more than sixty two percent of the city voted in favor of Prop uh, sixty four, and then they had a workshop, a public workshop in December, and more than ninety percent of the people showed up said they would rather the city craft regulations than do it at the. So what box. gave them cold feet? Uh, the claims of certain marijuana, uh, anti-marijuana activists that it would increase crime, that people are consuming poisonous edibles. Uh, what they were doing was, honestly, they were just cherry-picking certain studies uh, and twisting them in the most negative light. Like, for instance, they took a UC Davis study uh, from last year, February of 2017, saying, hey, there are certain mold and fungi that you find, certain bacteria that you find in, in even legalized marijuana products. And they've been waving that around saying, look, this is poisonous. It's going to it's going to sicken everybody in the community. But the truth is, uh, it's early testing. And more importantly, the research had actually said, you should probably just take edibles instead. So are they aware that people have been using marijuana and IV for some time? <laughs> well, so that's the thing is a lot of the activists who showed up and dominated the conversation aren't even from IB. Oh. Poway, even Chula Vista. They're starting a new front, kind of. Essentially, yeah. And I think the community had assumed that this thing was going to pass, so they didn't even show up. The only people who showed up are the ones who want business licenses, so they have a financial interest in being there. Yeah, we're going to take Sergey here up to one of the stores he's been interested. So you, uh, you were, we came out and I asked you what you wanted to maybe learn about as you were here, and you said California's experiment with the legalizing cannabis was something you had in mind. Why? Uh, that's because of the cannabis. It's a huge uh, deal uh, in Russia. Uh, you know, there's uh, so many people, uh, young people in jail, like uh, America, uh, I think. And um, w- my school made now in jail one of those because really? of the cannabis deal. Yeah. Uh, the most popular um, drugs in uh, Russia, of course, it's a club drugs. But uh, the most uh, cases, criminal cases, uh, is... Uh, about uh, cannabis. Really? So, yeah. like, most people are into like ecstasy these days. Uh, yeah, yeah. The popular is ecstasy, but uh, the most uh, cases uh, when you can go to the jail, it's a cannabis, of course. Uh, well, um, so it's very interesting to see how the California solves this problem. Uh, well, we'll see. They, as you see, uh, one of the things that Jesse's been reporting on is that so much of the market is still in the black market so there's an effort to 
get all the black market into the open market, regulated and stuff. Hey, do we have any updates on how that's going? Well, so the last uh, I saw, 85% of cities and counties in California still ban cannabis completely. Um, and then locally. And I'm I mean, going to guess people in those places still use it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, the demand is going to be constant, if not growing. And if you keep the supply artificially low, what do you expect is going to happen? Right. So, all right. So let's hear your conversation with Dr. Thomas Marcotte. He's uh, from UC San Diego's Center for Medical Cannabis Research. All right, everyone, welcome back. I'm Jesse Marks, associate editor here at The Voice of San Diego, and I cover politics as well as uh, pot here, um, among other things. Uh, Much of my own reporting has focused over the last few months on more of the public policy side of things and the enforcement of the industry, but uh, happy to change a little direction here today and talk about some of the significant research which is actually taking place in our backyard. So I am joined by Dr. Tom Marcotte, co-director of the University of California, San Diego Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. Uh, he's a busy man, and he's doing important and interesting work, and uh, we're really happy to have him in the studio today. So thanks, Tom, for being here. And thank you for having me here. So, um, Tom, let's start at the beginning. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your background and, and how you got hooked up with the, uh, with the center here in town. Yeah, so I'm a professor here at the University of California, San Diego. I actually started at UCSD back in the 90s uh, doing a fellowship. Uh, Early around 2000, the center received funding from the state of California for the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. So my my early interests and ongoing interests are the effects that HIV has on the brain. Uh, One of those interests also includes the effects it has on real world functioning, so ability to drive a car. Well, when we received this funding from the state to start looking at potential medical aspects of cannabis, We were also interested in looking at the full spectrum of effects. So how does it affect cognition? How does it affect driving performance? So back at that time, I started doing driving simulations and and cognitive testing, and that's been going on ever since. Did did you say the center's been around since 2000? Correct. That's that's way longer than I had imagined, and that actually seems pretty, um, for lack of a better term, trailblazing. It it was. It was. So it was the first uh, center to start doing smoked and vaporized cannabis studies in many, many years. Uh, we did a number of studies during the 2007, actually, looking at the effects of uh, short-term effects of smoked or vaporized cannabis on things such as neuropathic pain and spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Uh, so those were really the only major clinical studies going on at the time, uh, and then it went quiet for a while. So, so that would probably help explain part of why I've seen you guys come up a lot in the national press. It sounds like you've had you've been established here for quite a while, probably built up a name for yourselves across the country. Because I can't imagine there are a lot of places in the United States that are doing this. There are not. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I say, we had a lot of studies going on early on. Since then, in the last few years, we've had some funded studies from the National Institutes of Health looking at the effect of cannabis on, on pain. Uh, in people with HIV, uh, but there aren't a lot of studies taking place, at least up until the last year or two. Now uh, there's a, an explosion of increased interest, the effects of cannabis and cannabinoids, so even not the plant itself on these different conditions. Did, did you have any personal strong feelings one way or another before legalization? I did not. No? Yeah. Um, do Is it noteworthy that uh, some of the leading participants in, in the center themselves are psychiatrists? It, it, I've covered this issue for years, and, and generally the... If I can speak generally, the field had seems to view pretty skeptically um, cannabis and cannabis research. At least what I've noticed, there's often been psychiatrists who are who are opposed to legalization in certain parts of the country. Um, is that is that something that we should that we should flag and that you consider noteworthy as, as well? Uh, I would say that is the case. In, in this case, the the director of the center, Dr. Igor Grant, is a psychiatrist and neuropsychiatrist, and, and as I said, our original. Uh, Relationships started back in the 90s at the HIV Research Center. So even though he's a psychiatrist, he's very interested in the broad range of effects of HIV as well as things that might make the condition better. In this case, back in the late 90s, we were getting a lot of anecdotal evidence that people who used cannabis were getting some impayment, uh, improvement from wasting and, and so forth. And so it was a particular area of interest for him. Can, so give us some of the background then on the driving study. Um, this You mentioned a second ago that some of the funding for it had actually come from Proposition 64. Um, that seems significant. Why Why did um, the officials in, in Sacramento, well, I guess it would have come from the ballot measure initially, but why? Like, how did how did the funds come down here to us? 
So, so actually, the funding came from a specific legislation uh, sponsored in part by Assemblyman Lackey, who is a former CHP officer and was very interested in the potential negative consequences of uh, the upcoming legalization of cannabis. So we really wanted to do what we could do to identify better ways to identify impaired drivers. So that was even pre-Prop uh, 64. Uh, that funded us uh, starting a little over a year ago to start this project. Uh, okay. And then within um, Proposition 64 itself or the subsequent the regulations that they crafted, it, it sent additional money down here? Is that is that fair? So there are funds coming to the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. So, so to our center in general, we're going to get about $2 million a year, and that's to fund research looking at the, the medical benefits, the medical consequences of, of using cannabis. Those can include driving uh, impairments. Uh, and then the CHP itself is also getting funding of about $3 million a year to uh, enhance their program in identifying impaired drivers. So essentially what, what this specific study is doing is you're, you're giving people cannabis, you're giving other people placebo, and you're seeing how they would uh, operate a vehicle in a simulated setting. Can you break down for us what exactly you're doing and what that looks like for us because we can't see it? Sure. So we're actually going to assess 180 people, and we're randomizing them to one of three conditions. So they'll get either a placebo a joint or cigarette, uh, this is cannabis that we get from the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, in which they've pulled out the THC, or they're getting a, a relatively low dose cannabis cigarette of 5.9% or a higher dose at 13.4%. So 60 people each will get those conditions. Uh, and then we put them during the course of a day, a, a little bit before they smoke and then after they smoke, a series of driving simulations, uh, looking at things not only such as the amount of swerving and ability to divide attention, but decisions they make in terms of making a left-hand turn in front of traffic and so yeah. forth. Um, we're also collecting fluids. So a, a strong area of interest is whether or not there's a reasonable per se law uh, limit, which would say that at this amount of THC in your blood, you're an impaired driver. So we're collecting data on both blood, uh, oral fluid or saliva, and breath to see if those tell us anything about impairment or time since someone smoked. We also have this really interesting collaboration with the drug recognition experts. These are called DREs. These are the sort of creme de la creme of the impaired driving uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, and they are coming down and conducting field sobriety tests on our participants four times during the day. That sounds scary. Uh, uh, no, they're nice guys. Uh, and then the final component is uh, we've developed some iPad-based measures that are very brief cognitive tests. Because what happens, unlike with alcohol, the real effects of cannabis tend to be more cognitive rather than physiological, so you're not staggering and so forth. So we're trying to see whether or not some of these iPad tests might uh, help law enforcement identify individuals who are or are not impaired due to cannabis. So, so I've seen a lot of movies where they're like police simulation um, situations where like they, they go into a room and then like a character pops up and they have to make a split second decision on whether or not they shoot somebody. Are we? Is this sort of the same thing that people have to deal with? You said like something will come across their radar and they'll have to swerve. You'll see how they swerve. You see how they move. So what, what are you actually testing for? So we're testing the ability to stay vigilant. Uh, we're testing the ability to judge distance and time. So as I commented, this left-hand turn is, is always a highly risky maneuver uh, for people. So you have to see how fast the cars are coming. We're looking at how people uh, do in terms of merging into freeway traffic and then getting off of the freeway quickly. Uh, so we're really trying to get the full gamut of things that might be affected by cannabis. So depth and time perception, uh, attention, psychomotor speed, how quickly you respond to uh, potential crash incidents. So one of the debates I remember coming out of Colorado, that there was a report which um, has been disputed, and it, and, and it looked at um, w what they described as marijuana, I think, related traffic accidents. And the major point of contention, and this was actually between the Department of Justice and between Colorado's own attorney general and governor, and, and the point of contention was, well, if somebody has marijuana in their system and then two days later they get in, in, into an accident, can we still reasonably describe that as being marijuana-related? Is, is your research in any way going to potentially shed light on that dispute? I know that's a, a, it's partly a political dispute, but um, I, th I feel like the ramifications for, for public safety would be significant. Are you going to 
Would you, would you look at the long-term effects of marijuana as well as the short-term? So we're only going out about six to seven hours after they smoke. Okay. So we can't address that situation. But you know, if it turns out in our studies that after five hours, someone is not showing significant impairment on the driving simulator or even on the field sobriety tests, that does add some credence to the fact that just because you have THC in your blood doesn't necessarily mean you're impaired, and let alone too impaired to drive. Yeah. Because as you probably know, THC hangs around for a long time, and there have been studies where uh, they put people in the hospital to monitor them after they stop smoking. And, and in people who use it frequently, uh, daily, uh, and perhaps many uh, joints per day, it can hang around your blood for many, many days. And the, the actual impairing effects are probably long gone at that point. So, so how much are you paying people to get high all day long? I believe we're up to, uh, now you've got me, I think it's like $180 or something, yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a full day. It's not, uh, I'm not sure how many people would say, yeah, I'll do that again, but I think they enjoy it. Uh, but we put them to work. It's a yeah. pretty good day's work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may get placebo though, so there you go. Um, so, so can you draw any conclusions at this point, Tom? Like, So the design of the study is we're staying blinded mm -hmm. because the potential is if you start peeking at the data, uh, some of these measures are uh, subjective, they're objective, but they also have the potential to have some bias. So if you think, oh, we should get more impairment than we're seeing, et cetera, that could change people's judgments. So we're staying blind and, and do not have any uh, outcomes yet. Uh, so you mentioned this a second ago, but can you tell us about some some of the regulatory challenges? I assume that there has to be D DEA oversight of the research that you're doing. and. Correct. So it takes about a year to get this type of project started. So even once you have the funding, people have approved the general design and protocol. Uh, you need to get approval from a number of regulatory agencies. So you go to the Food and Drug Administration, you get something called an Investigational New Drug Application, or an IND. And so they review the protocol and make sure that they feel it's safe uh, for human to participate in it. You also need to have what's called a Schedule One license from the Drug Enforcement Administration, so right now, marijuana or cannabis is considered a Schedule One, which is sort of the most restrictive license you can have. On par with heroin. Exactly, yeah. exactly, uh, with no medicinal value and so forth. Um, so you get that license, then you also have to have your pharmacy licensed. Um, so that takes a while, and then they come and they inspect, the DA inspects your, your pharmacy to make sure there's no risk of diversion. Uh, and then you order the cannabis from NIDA, uh, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, they have one farm in Mississippi that supplies it, so then you wait and, and hopefully get the, the blend that you want. Yeah, the federal government has quite a monopoly on, on the marijuana trade, don't they? They do. Uh, you, you said there's, they, they want to ensure that there's no risk of, of diversion, which seems kind of um, uh, which seems odd, considering that anyone could just go buy it off the streets, but um, they certainly have their way of doing things. So. Yeah, so as long as it's Schedule 1, they need to follow these, these protocols. So, Tom, uh, how at, at this point in time are uh, police out in the field um, assessing sobriety? So, so currently they base their assessment looking at your driving performance and see if that raises any concerns. Uh, when you get pulled over, you get a field sobriety test from the, the law enforcement officer who first identified the problem. If indeed that person suspects that there's impairment due to some drug, but it's not readily clear, then he may call in someone called a drug recognition expert who has very advanced training in terms of identifying impaired driving due to drugs. So that person will do even a more comprehensive evaluation of the driver, somewhat akin to a mini neurologic exam. Uh, then they'll also take fluids such as blood to see whether or not you have any substances uh, in your system. Seems complicated. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a fairly serious procedure. Yeah. Uh, so specifically tell us about per se laws. What are those? Okay. So per se laws are, are an attempt by sort of legislature to identify a cut point where uh, a person is called impaired or driving under the influence if they're at that cut point. So for example, for alcohol, it's 0.08, and that's been sort of readily agreed upon. You could still be held responsible for driving under the influence and being impaired below that if, say, you're at 0.04, but you're still intoxicated. Um, and there's been an attempt to try to do that with uh, cannabis or marijuana as well. The, the challenge in that, though, is that cannabis has a very different, uh, what we call pharmacodynamics, or the way it, it distributes in the blood. So when you drink alcohol, it's pretty linear. So the more you drink, the, the higher your blood alcohol goes up. With cannabis, when, say, you smoke it, uh, your levels go really high really quick uh, in the first 10 minutes or so, but then it gets distributed out of the blood into your fat cells, into your brain, 
And so in the blood, you may have low levels, but you still could be stoned or impaired. Uh, and the way this works, though, is because of that distribution, you could get, uh, you could be really high in terms of your cognitive performance and not doing well and have really high levels in your blood. But conversely, a little bit later, you could have low levels in your bud, blood and still be impaired. And then over that last hour or two, um, the levels drop in terms of how high you're feeling, but there's very little change in the blood. So you can have low levels of THC in your blood and not be impaired many hours later after you smoked. And would it change with edibles? Uh, it does. So with edibles, it's a very sort of uh, similar but different process. So with edibles, it goes through your liver. So that's called first pass metabolism. And THC gets changed into a, a component called 11 hydroxy THC. So what you measure in someone who's at an edible is you look at this 11 hydroxy and not the THC level. And when you do an edible, you start feeling the effects, say, an hour later, and it can last much longer than when you smoke. So it's a very different sort of impairment profile or highness profile and very different in the blood as well and actually a different compound that you're looking for in the blood. So the one thing I would add is, is law enforcement, because one of the problems in looking at THC is that when you want to draw blood, it usually takes an hour or two to get to a hospital so they can draw your blood. So even if you'd smoked fairly recently, by the time you get there, the, the level in your blood is quite low. So law enforcement is looking at sort of oral swabs. Is it possible to just sort of get a dab inside a person's cheek and detect THC? That's um, still in development because it also may detect THC beyond the time when someone's impaired. Uh, but that's part of the research we're doing as well. Yeah. Um, so can you also tell us about, uh, I read that you got, you got money, um, a grant, I think it was $4.7 million for a separate study involving, uh, potentially the links between, um, CBD and the alleviation of, of autism. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that as well? Are you working on that personally? Uh, so I'm involved. I'm not one of the primary investigators, but I'm helping coordinate uh, that. Uh, no, that was a spectacular gift from the Norda Foundation, and they collaborate with a, a group called the Holistic Foundation who helps sort of screen the proposals. Um, and so, yes, we received a, a lot of money to study the effects of CBD in really severely uh, kids with severe autism disorder, which is which usually isn't done. And, and we should explain to, to listeners, C CBD is a non-psychoactive compound which is found in cannabis, Correct. 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 Uh, there's a lot of evidence in various conditions that it may be of some benefit. So what's really unique about this study is that in addition to uh, assessing uh, some children and using this drug uh, or the CBD with them, we also have some kind of mechanistic components where we will look at um, sort of stem cells or, or cells from the children and see whether or not uh, they look different when you apply uh, CBD to them and kind of look at the... Um, functional neurological con connectivity taking place uh, in those sort of brain cells that we grow. So it's really a, a broad spectrum study. It, is the research on, on CBD at this point in, at this point in time largely anecdotal? Um, it, 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 I mean, we know some famous cases out of Colorado, right? Like right. Charlotte uh, Figge, uh, the, the young girl who was suffering from seizures who had, who had um, benefited from CBD. So what do we know at this point in time? So there are a number of studies taking place. Uh, just last year, there was a study reporting on uh, a drug called Epidiolex, which has a, a large CBD component showing in, in children who have severe and frequent seizures that it cut in half the amount of seizures they had when they uh, did a number of weeks of treatment with CBD. There are other studies, smaller scale and sort of preliminary, showing that it may help in prodromal schizophrenia, sort of the early signs of someone having some psychosis. Um, That's uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, as well as people who actually have psychotic episodes that there may be some benefit. There's a study also looking at anxiety, showing it may improve anxiety. Th that's interesting to me because because all I've ever heard is that uh, uh, people who do suffer from severe mental illnesses should be careful about using cannabis because it could exacerbate their problems. Yeah, so, so that's actually a terrific point to make, which is using the term cannabis is rather inexact and cannabis can be so many different things uh, from we, we usually think about THC or the psychoactive effects but as you noted CBD is not really psychoactive in terms of impairing but it may have some positive psychoactive effects with respect to anxiety and then there are many other components of the plant that we just don't understand in terms of what they may do uh, either in a positive or negative way these are things such as the terpenoids the things that give it you know, the aroma and so forth, uh, whereas in 
other plants and, and uh, well, and other plants and vegetables and so forth, we know some of the roles of those things. Um, so, so more broadly speaking, Tom, where, where do you feel like all this research is, is headed? What do you think is going to be the net effect on uh, public policy over the next five years, 10 years? I, I imagine it's going to evolve dramatically, and it's already doing so in terms of the uh, openness, even at the federal level, of people to consider the role of cannabis, and, and in particular the cannabinoids, as we learn more details about what CBD may do that may tell us more about mechanisms for some disorders, such as anxiety or psychosis, which could lead to new new drug discoveries. Yeah, this seems like a perfect place for it, right? You have so many biopharmaceutical companies here as well. It'll be natural fit. Yeah. Uh, so the challenge, of course, is dealing with regulatory issues. And, and one of the challenges we face as uh, are faced around the country is as long as it stays Schedule 1, we really can't even touch or look at what people are using out in the real world. So we can't analyze it for content and, and so forth until uh, regulations come down. So let's say that they drop it to, to Schedule 2 or Schedule 3. What, what exactly changes for you? Uh, I think it gives greater access. Schedule two still will have people have to, they'll still need to get the various licenses, et cetera. Um, but I think it mu- makes it much easier for other groups that may not have uh, the resources needed to, to do this kind of study. And, and what are your, what, what is your hope for that? What is your expectation of the federal government changing that anytime soon? It seems like, it seems like Trump may, <laughs> it seems like, it seems like Trump is actually leaning towards um, letting the states decide, but not, he, it doesn't seem like he's quite there just yet for rescheduling at the federal level. I guess it's anyone's guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the look on your face as a next question. <laughs> um, and anything else that you guys are studying that we should keep in mind, Tom, that uh, we should be on the radar for? So one of the projects we have going on is really interesting. So I'd mentioned that we're looking at neuropathic pain. Well, we have actually a take-home study. So most of the studies that we had done, as well as many groups looking at plant material, were you know, you come in and you smoke it in the, the laboratory. In this case, we really don't know much about the longer term effects. And so we're looking at least a little bit longer. And in this study, people will take the, the cannabis home. This is actually a mix of THC and CBD and vaporize it at home. Uh, they will also get a, a pill called dronabinol, which is a, an approved version of THC. And they're blinded as to which version they're getting. And we'll see over the course of a couple months whether or not it shows benefit. Okay, that's great. Well, um, thanks for coming in. Tom, anything else we should keep in mind? That'll do it. All right. Um, Appreciate you coming in, and uh, we'll check back in with you soon, hopefully. Um, You're listening to the Voice of San Diego podcast. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Now back to my discussion with Greg Buck Buchanan. He's the uh, president of the Prevent Drowning Foundation of San Diego. I remember I first heard about, I, I tweeted one time, I was like, boy, it'd be fun to jump off the pier one time. And, and you said, hey, so <laughs> we have this program if you want to do it. Next thing I know, it's for a cause that I started to get really passionate about. I love the event. Uh, I go out and do it. Um, this year, you're going to have two of them. Uh, first of all, who does it benefit and uh, where does all that funds go? So you pay about 50 bucks to jump? Or? It's a $75 donation. Mm-hmm. And basically, it's a fundraiser for the foundation. And all the money and proceeds goes then directly back into Teach Kids in San Diego How to Swim. So basically, our mission is to essentially teach kids to swim. Underserved areas are our primary focus. And then give aquatic safety education to everyone in San Diego. Right. But the idea is, uh, you're doing. we're doing this pure jump. It's for a great cause, but there are a, a few caveats. <laughs> one, you have to know how to swim. That's a key okay. one. And, and and I'm not joking about that. Right. We've had some people who've done, who forgot about the swimming element. So you actually have to go through a safety presentation. There's a waiver and you have to have swim fins because as you know, there's three different locations that you can jump from, whether depending upon your child's age or whether you just want to go from the 15, 25 or 35 foot range. And w- why is it important to have people jump, or what, what's the what's the value of that? Just the the thrill, or does it actually teach them something too? Well, I mean, what, our tagline on this that was put by the Junior Guard Program is "Face your fear, jump the pier." So basically, it's about building confidence. There's a lot of training in the Junior Guard Program. They actually go down to one of the local docks and they put like a three foot up, three foot high 
little block and they practice their technique. They have video. So it's like some of these kids, I mean, you're talking nine-year-olds up to 17-year-olds and then adults such as yourself. I mean, you may say you want to do it, but you, you got to yeah, have- Yeah, it's a different you, thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a challenge. And, and the kids go through the same thing. And I'll tell you, most of them jump. It's certainly not a requirement to jump. But man, when they jump in the water, just like the adults, the face, the jubilation, the joy, and like, wow, I did it. I did something that maybe I never thought I would do. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a moment. Uh, yeah, it's, it's my first time. It was, it's, it's a far enough fall that you think about it while you're falling. You know, you, you're on a high, dum- high dive or something. You, you jump off, it's just immediate you're in the water, you know? Right. This is high enough that you got a minute or a second to think about it. Oh, yeah. It's definitely. something else. Well, what I actually in particular, I love, as you know, you you walk out towards the end of the pier yeah. for your jumping location, right? Yeah. And so you get to choose whether you want to do the big, medium, or little, but you always go big, which is, you know, your personality, but you get out there. It's a pretty decent walk, so you're chit-chatting. Yeah. But then you're starting to go, okay, what did the safety talk say? Okay, I have my fins. Okay, now now what am I doing? And, you know, and, and I've always enjoyed like the way that people all of a sudden click into, oh boy, I'm doing this. I, I'm committed, mm-hmm. whether I got my kid next to me or whether it's just a group of friends. I know you brought some of the staff here and it's, it's, a, it's a hilarious transformation. Now I will tell you, you're pretty good. You don't get freaked out as much as a lot of people. <laughs> you stay pretty tight. Yeah. I've learned some tricks. Got to keep your legs together. <laughs> you definitely want to do that. <laughs> And, uh, and keep your arms up. Uh, one time my fin broke as we were swimming back in, got to have fins, right? Yep. yep exactly. And, uh, and so I ended up having to carry it cause I didn't want to leave plastics in the ocean. Or whatever. Well, of course not. And, no. And swim in. So no, that was you something. You get kicked out of OB for that. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, and, it, and it's funny cause I, I remember when you started getting involved in it, you were early in on the process and basically it's a celebration of San Diego. It's very unique. I mean, the relationship that the our foundation has with the city's great and the junior guards love it. So not only do they get a chance, maybe their parents or their uncle and aunt or just friends and then other supporters in the community like Voice of San Diego. So it's it really is a good team day. And it's like I think back to just the energy on the beach and then people cruise up the, you know, yeah. up Newport and get lunch. And it's it's a really fun celebration. And it's at the highest summer too. It feels like a classic San Diego day no matter what. There's a you get that feeling once you jump into the ocean, you get that moment where it's that part of it happened, but you do, there's nothing like being out in the open water in the, in an ocean. The energy of the ocean is different than any kind of pool you can be in, but yet you're around people and you're all doing it as a team to get back into shore. And that's just a, that's not something you're ever going to get in a pool or any kind of, even at the La Jolla Cove or something. This is a, it's a, it's a great feeling and it's just a, it's wonderful to be out there with like the mayor or whoever's jumping that day and, and just be, you know, part of a group that are, are experiencing something unique. So you can oh, talk about Oh it. yeah. And I mean, it's the politicians love doing it because they try to get their office out there. Just like what right. you've done, you try to rally up the troops and, you know, of course the person who likes to do it is, is, is the person who's trying to get everybody there. But at the same time you get, you know, you jump next to your child if you're just a parent right. and you get a little snap photo and like that's a Christmas card right there for right. sure. But then if you go with your coworkers and then, of course, there's always a few who might be there taking pictures and rooting yawn, which is we want anybody coming out there because it's a it's a great like viewing area right off the pier as you you can watch your friends and family, you know, go into the water and then and then do the uh, oh. the long swim back. And you guys got me that uh, picture showing the sequence one time and my face was oh. Oh, yeah. transforming the whole time into some level of terror. <laughs> uh, sorry, re- right, remind us. So it's uh, there's one July 9th and there's one August 13th. How Correct. do they sign? You, can you sign up or you just go and show up? Uh, well, basically it's uh, first come, first serve with deference to parents. So mm-hmm. there's a system there to make sure, sure the public can join us, but parents get to go first. But uh, through the... Uh, yeah, preventdrowningfoundation.org is our website. But yeah, you're showing up to Ocean Beach basically uh, in the morning uh, and putting yourself on a wait list and going through the waiver, the training, and make yeah. sure you have fans. So there's, it's uh, it's a super fun day, but come on, it's it's got to be safe, right? Yeah. S- safety first, because we, we don't want anybody, I mean, you, you can have a thrill of a lifetime, but you want to be able to have a thrill of a lifetime. Yeah, not, and there's so many- negative. Yeah, there's so many safeguards in place, but you're right. It's still up to you to swim in, and you need to make sure you take care of that. 
Yeah, yeah, which is no small feat. So yeah. I mean, just check yourself here. You know, like for anybody who wants to come, whether you want to bring your company or you, you know your coworkers or your junior guard family and stuff like that, make sure you can do the swim because it's not. We're not trying to make right. you know lifeguards make rescues on on pier jumpers. <laughs> that that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. Yeah, and then the tips are great too. You know, the idea of of raising your hand up, say you got through the jump, all right, right. Uh, and then pulling in, but you feel great once you get out of the water and you go get some food after that. Like, it's just a, it's a wonderful San Diego experience. I think really incomparable, a lot of things there, but you also, so you get a thrill, but then you're also helping a, a good cause. So I'll do the August 13th early one, 9 a.m. Come out with me. I'm, I'm really good now at helping people get through that little <laughs> the freak out phase in the beginning. And, uh, I've talked to a few uh, people, even some politicians through that one now. It's a lot of fun and uh, a great experience. So look forward to this year. It's going to be great as usual. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Voice of San Diego podcast. This show is part of the Voice of San Diego podcast network. Visit voicesandiego.org slash podcast to learn more about our education podcast, Good Schools for All, And our partner shows, Beer Talk Radio, the Kept Faith Sports Podcast, and the rest of the shows in the network of local podcasts.